Hey everyone, this is Becoming a Bible Nerd. I'm Carrie Hunt, and I'm so glad that you are joining us. We believe this ancient Eastern text was never meant to study alone, so we choose to do it in community. We will take one book a semester, one chapter a week, and really dig in to understand the context and the culture that the book was written in so that we can better understand how to apply what God was saying to our lives. Our goal is to equip you and your community to fall more in love with Jesus because you have fallen in love with his word. This season, we are going through the books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and today's episode is 1st John, Chapter 2, The Clean Life, Part 2. Um, I'm so sorry about um, last week's recording. It only allows me to record for one hour, and then it cuts off, and I had no idea that I had been talking that long. So I backed it up to about 45 minutes and stopped it, and then we will pick up. I'll, I'll do the rest today. And um, it's really a great chapter, so much in store. So we left off talking about John was warning these Christians, the new believers, the ones that were seasoned with wisdom, the ones that are on the front lines fighting. He warned them not to love the world. Um, and he warned them for everything in the world um, was dangerous, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. We talked about how that seeps into the church where men um, become powerful and there's a lot of money involved and it can ruin you. Just um, if we let the world into the church, it's going to have the same effect on us as it does everyone else. And the counterpart to that, because God never, ex he, we were not built to handle power, pleasure, or money, but the opposite of that is self-control generosity and humbleness and um, I left off just urging you to make sure you find someone in this discipleship process um, someone to lead you with those qualities and characteristics so in verse 18 John continues and he says dear children this is the last hour and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come, and this is how we know it's the last hour. So I had spoken last episode about really viewing John not as a spiritual father, but as a spiritual grandfather, because he's full of wisdom, and he has that fatherly component, but it's almost over the top with love and encouragement and just tender mercies. And so I really just see him as a grandfather. And he is warning his grandchildren of grandchildren of wolves in sheep's clothing. Now I say that this is an urgent message for his great grandkids, which would be us, because if they were living in the last hour, then we are living in the last minutes. It truly is just a matter of time. We talked about this over and over again. And while there were antichrists, the Antichrist spirit, people that would come. Antichrist isn't exactly like, oh, it opposes Christ. Um, the Antichrist comes in almost the name of Christ. He will use the same language and the same charisma, and he's going to do signs and wonders, and he's going to fool people into believing that he is the Messiah. And we have had many Antichrists in this world, but in the last days, because of these lying signs and signs and wonders, we, the only thing that we have to recognize that this is false is discernment. And the only way to get this discernment is to be in the Word. And we talked last time about how people can so easily be deceived just by using the name of Jesus. Hey, I'm going to use the name of Jesus and I'm going to throw in love and I can deceive people. So, this experience, John talks about love a lot, and this experience of love and intimacy was unheard of in this Greco-Roman world. Um, the Stoic counterpart, the philosophers of the day, they really reflected a different idea. It was more of a selfish love, focus on yourself, put up a wall with others, treat your, um, free yourself from the demands of others, and it, this philosophy even called its followers to maintain distance from wife and children. Um, we see that John is saying, no, we're, we're going to love well. We're going to go the extra mile. We're going to um, invest ourselves that love is an action. We're not just going to say it, but we're going to pour our lives out for our brothers and sisters. One of the things 
things that he talks about it here is this last hour. We've talked about this, gosh, in Daniel. We talked about it in Romans. We talked about Thessalonians. We talked about First Corinthians. All of the biblical authors are telling us that we need to be living with this expectancy of Christ's return. You know, it makes me think of the flood, and Jesus said um, that right before he returns, it will be like in the days of Noah. And in the days of Noah, they were eating, drinking, and being merry, and there was this warning of a flood, and no one was prepared for it. They just were living their life oblivious of this flood coming while Moses, not Moses, Noah was preparing for this. Well, the same thing needs to be true about Christ's second coming. We don't need to just be eating, drinking, and being merry, not thinking about it. We need to be preparing, and by preparing, the Lord tells us, to fill our lampstands, he gives us the parable of the, the two virgins, and half of them had their lampstands full. Those were the ones that were prepared. They were the ones that were expecting the bridegroom to come, and that is how we were to live our life. So, this Antichrist that John talks about, the false Messiah, he will say things that sound biblical but are not, and Christ warns us about this fella and the spirit um, in Matthew 24, 24, and he's going to be a sinister figure that will rise and exalt himself against God. He talked about it in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. His spirit is already here in the form of many antichrists, claims John. But we are going to take a minute and see what Jesus said about the last days. So I am going to read from Mark chapter 13, starting in verse 20. And I'm going to read about three verses, what Jesus said in the last days. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect whom he had chosen, he has shortened them. At that time, if anyone says, look, here is the Messiah, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. These signs and wonders will even fool some of the followers of Christ. So be on guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. It's in the word. How do we know these things that Jesus told us ahead of time? We get into the word and we know them. We, we write his word on the tablets of our heart. In Matthew 24, starting at verse 10, Jesus says, At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. We see this today. And it's so crazy because it's really the opposite. The people that are speaking truth and love, God's truth, they are labeled as haters. But then there's people all in the world that are living as of the world that are full of hate. And we're calling it love. Um, back to 1 John, in verse 19, it says, They went out from us, but they really did not belong to us. These are people that are operating in the spirit of Antichrist. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but their going showed that none of them belonged to us. So we know that John encountered this, um, the spirit, and he talks about it. The author of these epistles that we're going through this semester, he shares with us how he has encountered that when he wrote the Revelation. Um, whenever he writes the revelation, it starts off in chapter 2 where this, the angel of the Lord, which is Jesus, comes to John and says, write to these seven churches that you're overseeing. And he tells them exactly what to write. So in Ephesus, to Ephesus, in Revelations 2.2, 2, the angel of the Lord said, write, you have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles, but they are not. You have discovered they are liars. So Jesus is recognizing that the Ephesian church heard people saying, hey, I'm an apostle, I, I come and speak for God, but what they were saying doesn't match up what Paul and John have taught them, what they were writing to them, and so they called them liars. They recognized it because they had that discernment. Okay, so to the letter in Pergamum, this is Revelation 2, 14 through 16, the angel of the Lord told John to write, and yet I have these few things against you. You tolerate some among you who do as Balaam did and taught the lack how to ruin the people of Israel by involving them in sexual sin and encourage them to go into idol feasts. So the 
this is what God had against um, Pergamum, is that they tolerated this um, sinful way of sexual sin and idol feasts. It goes on and says, likewise, you have, you also have those who hold on to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So Pergamum is tolerating these false teachers. Now, Thyatira, I never can say that right, in Revelation 2.20, the angel of the Lord told John to write, Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and eating of the food sacrificed to idols. So, we see that some of the churches in the end, well, in this, these aren't churches of the end days. These were churches that John was overseeing. And some of them were not using their discernment or they weren't running those false prophets off and calling them out. So back to 1 John in verse 20, it says, But you have an anointing from the Holy One. Now remember, he is addressing baby Christians, the old and the wise, and then the younger men who have matured and they're on the battle. Like they were out front fighting against this by using the word of God. And he's saying to all of you, you all have an anointing um, from the Holy One. And all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, because you do know it. And because no lie comes from the truth. Who is a liar? It's whoever denies that Jesus is the anointed one. That Jesus is the Christ. Those people are liars. There is a an old ancient philosophy that is prevalent today. It's just repackaged itself and renamed itself. It's new thought, new age, that we can become a Christ figure. That Jesus was just an example of what all of us that can become. And it is not the belief that you get to God only through Jesus Christ. John says here, whoever denies that Jesus is the anointed one. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Those are false teachers. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. No one denies the Son. Um, no one who denies the Son has the Father. So there are people that can be doing good things, and they're charitable, and they're servants, and they worship God, but they do not recognize Jesus as the Messiah. Well, John here is saying, if you deny the Son, you do not have the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son also acknowledges the Father. There are there are religions um, that fall under Christianity. They will say they are Christians, but they do not accept that there is only one way to God, and that is through Jesus Christ. And those are false religions and false teaching. Anyone that elevates a prophet and their writings over the Bible and Jesus' teachings, that should be alarm bells for us. Um, so this group that John is writing to has an anointing. What does that mean? Well, in Moses' day, they would take olive oil and they would pour it on objects that were going to be used in the temple. It was a way to set them apart. These objects, this lampstand, this table of showbread, these, all of these objects are going to be set apart. We're not going to just use them for common everyday thing. They are set apart to be holy. Holy, that's what holy means, set apart. Our lives are to be set apart. Every single day, we are to be living as a tool for God. And so they would do the same thing, even back in Moses' day, to the priests. They would pour oil over them to set them apart for a special purpose. It's a picture of the overflow of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. And he is telling the audience, you all have this anointing because the Holy Spirit is in us. And we want him, we want to be so full of the Spirit that it outpours out of us and touches other people. Now, there are times that people in power can make an audience feel that they are the ones that have the special anointing, but the truth of the matter is we all have the anointing. We just need to learn how to operate in it. Verse 24, as for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. What have you heard from the beginning? That Jesus is the only way. If it does, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father, and this is what he has promised us, eternal life. Moving on, verse 26. 
I am writing uh, these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. As for you, the anointing you received from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as an anointed, but as his anointing teaches you about all these things, and as the anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. Now the Zondervan Illustrated Bible Background Commentary, that's a mouthful, has labeled this, this, this phrase, you do not need anyone to teach you, as a vigorous speech, uh, because John is teaching him, and we know that Paul taught him, but it's saying here, you do not need anyone to teach you. Now, I struggled with this, because I know that teacher is a gift from the Holy Spirit. We see that the whole pattern of discipleship is following a teacher, a rabbi, that's just another word, it's teacher. But I think what John is communicating is this carries, this is my conjecture. This is not something that I got from a commentary, but I think what he is communicating is not that teaching is not bad, but you don't need it. And if you feel like you need it and you are going to rely on false teaching, then you will do better not having a teacher and just relying on the Holy Spirit who is our teacher. And so I don't think he's saying throw out all teachers. Um, I think that he is saying that you don't need to have one. If it comes down to you, the only option is relying on the Holy Spirit, you better trust him over man. Um, this anointing, one t- once again, he's reminding us that it's available to all Christians because Christ is in us. There was a time that um, Yuli and I went to visit a church um, and the pastor there was talking about the special anointing that he had for restoring marriages. And the whole time he was talking about, you know, if you know anybody whose marriage is in trouble, come to me. Bring them to me. I have the anointing. And uh, my husband is a, a marriage counselor by degree and uh, practices that. If you ever need marriage counseling, reach out to us. Um, and I could see him so uncomfortable in his chair, and finally he leaned over, and he's like, every person in this room has the anointing as long as they're walking with the Holy Spirit, and he needs to be casting that vision into them and and, and bringing that forth through revelation, like, hey, you are anointed, and you can do this, and there are certain tools that I can teach you, and I can help you learn how to approach people and help their marriages. Um, And so... There, it should not be a situation, and we look at John. John's not saying, hey, I'm the anointed one, and he could have completely, hey, bring all your people to me because I'm anointed. Obviously, he was anointed, but he is raising them up to be an army of anointed followers of Christ. So verse 28, to wrap this up, it says, And now, dear children, continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. Once again, we should be looking at, for his coming, looking forward to it, looking for it, being prepared for it. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. We should look like our father. And when Jesus returns, he alludes that some is going to be afraid because they never knew him. Others will be ashamed because they knew that they should have been doing better. And he's saying, hey, You strive, you run your race, you strive to grow in him every single day so that when he does come, you can stand boldly before him. We have lots to go. This is a short little 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, short little um, segment. This is going to be a shorter semester, but there's so much truth, so much goodness to get out of this. I just encourage you to continue on, just like John said, that you are his little children. I'm his little uh, child. And that what we want to do is practice what we're reading. We're going to ask for help from the Holy Spirit. We're going to ask for wisdom and guidance and the ability to apply what we were saying, what he is saying to us, to our lives. We're going to walk in love whenever our brother or sister offend us and do horrible things even. We are going to lay that at the feet of Jesus. We're not going to walk in bitterness. We're not going to walk in unforgiveness. We are going to walk in kindness and love and challenge ourselves to this. We're going to be better. So I will see you Thursday. I'll talk to you later.